continue again i just want to remind uh anyone that just joined us to please mute yourself uh, helen o'connor and myself as i mentioned are co-leads of the la county perinatal and early childhood home visitation consortiums referral work group and uh, we are very excited to bring to you this morning uh, this webinar that will be addressing uh, housing, homelessness, and linkage to uh, resources for our families. From our work in the community, we know that uh, home visitors and other providers have difficulty helping their clients with housing services. Um, and with the increase of homelessness, this has become a bigger challenge. Locating housing webinar um, Local, locating housing, whether this is affordable, low-income housing, or crisis permanent housing for homeless families is challenging, and figuring out how to obtain these services can be even more difficult. In this webinar training, DPSS, the Department of Public Social Services, CalWORKs Division, along with LASA, Los Angeles Housing Services Authority, will help us identify uh, resources for housing, how to help eligible families work? access benefits. You need to dial that ask, one five ten. Please time. mute yourself. Could you please mute yourself to minimize the noise? At this webinar, last second, uh, we'll also share the program uh, programmatic changes that look at how pregnant women. Uh, single pregnant women are eligible for the coordinated entry system for families at their first trimester when they're experiencing uh, homelessness. Um, I will now uh, introduce our speakers. I would like to first thank our wonderful speakers for joining us this morning. Uh, Roberto de la Torre has a master's in public administration. He is a human services administrator uh, with the County of Los Angeles Department of Social Services, the CalWORK section. Mr. De La Torre has worked for DPSS for 12 years and is currently assigned to the CalWORK section's homeless unit. He has primary responsibility over the CalWORK's homeless assistance program in a four-month rent year. Earned his Master's of Public Administration degree from California State University. We are very excited to have you here, Mr. De La Torre, and we will uh, give you the floor shortly after I introduce um, our other speakers. Our second speaker, mm -hmm. uh, who will be joined by are with the Ho Chayo, a lead agency in SPA 7, one uh, which is Service Planning Area 7, one of the eight family solution centers. Uh, Ms. Diego is the Coordinated Entry System Family Coordinator for the Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority. Ms. Diego has been with the Los Angeles uh, Homeless Service Authority for over a year. She has seven years of direct homeless service in program management and two decades of real estate sales experience. She has conducted countywide trainings on chil um, children and family health and nutrition programs as the Director of Training and Education. Ms. Diego has served as a family advocate to ensure that children, mothers, and families have equitable access to quality health care. Ms. Diego shares the goal that the goal is to get to a place where every child in LA County has a place to call home that is appropriate, affordable, and it's safe, and where children can grow and thrive. Uh, we will also have the opportunity again to hear, hear from the whole child uh, who will be sharing with us the role that the Family Solutions Centers have in the uh, landscape of housing and homelessness. They'll be sharing um, appropriate housing um, services and how we can link families to a family solution center. And with that, um, I want to thank everyone thank again for, for joining us. And I would like to give the floor to Mr. Uh, Roberto de la Torre. Hello. Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me? 
Hello? We hear, yes. We hear yes. You. Okay. Thank you. I, I apologize. Uh, and thank you for the introduction. Um, so looking forward to this presentation. I think you, you started off by really spearheading kind of the nature of uh, the difficulties and the challenges we are facing. Um, you know, we recently had our homeless count and the numbers kind of indicate that despite tremendous progress in, on our side, uh, countywide and housing families and so forth, uh, we continue to face the challenge uh, when it comes to the homeless families and, and the numbers we are facing. So uh, today I'm going to talk about the various uh, housing and homeless programs that DPSS uh, has uh, for families over at on the CalWORKs side. So we have a number of benefits and services um, for homeless families, but we also have uh, families and uh, benefits and services for uh, families who may be at risk of homelessness. So I'm going to go ahead and get started with these. First, I'll provide a quick overview of the programs we're going to be talking about today. Okay, the first program we will be covering is called the CalWORKs Homeless Assistance Program. Uh, in parentheses here, we find that it's a safe program. We make that key distinction because this is a program that's found in every single county within the state of California. It's actually one that's mandated under state law for folks who are homeless and uh, receiving CalWORKs. It has two critical components to it, uh, the temporary homeless uh, assistance component, and it also has a permanent homeless assistance component as well as an arrearage component. I'll be discussing those in further detail in just a bit as I get started. But I also want to segue into these DPSS housing programs. We call those county programs. The reason why we call those county programs is because unlike the CalWORKs Homeless Assistance Program, these particular benefits and services are only available to families here in LA County. Uh, these are programs that we develop in-house at DPSS. Um, we have the Temporary Homeless Assistance Program Plus 14. Uh, we have our moving assistance program. We have our emergency assistance to prevent, prevent eviction program. And lastly, we have our four month rental assistance program. So really quickly, these particular benefits are ones that DPSS developed, which are in addition to uh, what would be the state program, which you would find in every county within the state of California. Uh, with that said as the backdrop, I'm going to go ahead and get started and I'll be beginning with the first one we mentioned, which is our temporary homeless, temporary homeless assistance program. So this particular benefit is a very important one. Um, it's a very important one because in terms of a need for shelter, uh, it provides up to 16 consecutive calendar days of shelter payments so that the family who may be on the street or has a need for shelter so that they can have 16 days and they must be consecutive of uh, temporary shelter payments. So when the family is eligible to this particular benefit, um, the family can receive anywhere from $85, that's the base rate, that would cover for a family of up to four, and they could get an additional $15 per day for each additional person in what we call the assistance unit, up to a maximum of $145 per day. So that is a range. If you have a family that's anywhere from one to four, uh, they're gonna get the $85 daily rate. And uh, like I mentioned, if there's additional folks inside the assistance unit, they can get the additional $15. It does max out at $145 per day. A uh, key thing on this particular benefit is that, again, 16 consecutive days, it's issued uh, incrementally. Uh, meaning that we issue like a seven-day issuance, then we do a return appointment, another seven-day issuance, and then the last two-day issuance. Um, one of the key things under this program is that, uh, under this particular benefit, is that the family must be looking for housing. That's one of the requirements. And they have to provide us with a sense of verification that they're complying with that. We also must, uh, we also ask that they provide us uh, needed verification, such as a receipt from the hotel or a motel or anything like that uh, that could verify that they're uh, using the money for what it was issued for. Uh, key thing on this particular benefit is it used to be limited to a once in a lifetime, but the good news is that it is now available every 12 months. Uh, that's really a good thing because when we're looking at situations where the family does not, not find permanent housing, uh, the great thing about this benefit is it resets after 12 months. So. Uh, whenever a family is still in the current instance of homelessness, they can come back and uh, the opportunity and the access point would open up again. Key things I want to mention here is um, 
we had some issues of not that long ago, we had, you know, things like natural disasters and fires like that. I just wanted to point out that although we have the rule that folks have to look for permanent housing as one of the criteria for this benefit, there are situations that would provide families with good cause. So any family that has become homeless due to like a natural disaster, uh, you know, like we have fires and rains and mudslides and so forth, that would be something that would not be could get good cause for this. So I just want to put that out there that it is possible that if a family is going through uh, unique circumstances, there is the ability to get good cause. I'm going to quickly segue into what we call expanded temporary homeless assistance. This is a bit different. Um, it still provides temporary shelter payments, but the key difference here is that it provides what is called a lump sum issuance. That means that instead of the benefit being issued incrementally, like I mentioned earlier, seven days, seven days, and then two days, or some sort of combination thereof, folks who are fleeing domestic violence, folks who are suffering from domestic violence and are trying to escape their abuser or anything like that, uh, is when they are a CalWORKS applicant, they come to a DPSS office and they apply for CalWORKS. While, they're, while they are a CalWORKS applicant, they are entitled to receive a 16-day lump sum issuance, meaning it's 16 whole days in one shot on one payment. So this provides definitely a way for the family to have a means to be able to flee in those types of situations and to provide safety to themselves and to their children. Um, again, it's very dynamic in the extent that it provides a whole 16 days in one particular uh, issuance. Additionally, this particular benefit is special because if the CalWORKS application is still pending on, let's say, day 17, we can issue a second lump sum issuance that would be available to the family at that point. Again, only in those situations where the CalWORKS application is still pending, for example, it hasn't been approved or denied and is still in the process, the family can get an additional 16 consecutive days via a lump sum payment under expanded temporary homeless assistance. Um, these families also are not, do not have to comply with the housing search requirement. We wanna provide flexibility there. So that's one of those other segues, we'll, although we require the search, we want folks to find permanent housing, but due to the unique circumstances of people going through a disaster or this, domestic violence, um, uh, we want to make sure that, but um, that we provide that. I want to talk about the, con the counterpart benefit to the state program. I talked about shelter payments, but I also want to make sure that it provides a very important payment and that is the permanent homeless assistance payment. This particular payment is designed to help the family to pay for their needed uh, security deposit costs. Now, security deposit costs can include the last month's rent, and the, any legal payment fee, deposit, or charge that is required by the landlord as a condition of assuming occupancy. The amount that the benefit can cover, it covers up to two times the rent amount. So. In addition to that, in addition to a needed security deposit, the Perm HA payment, as we call it, a DPSS, can also provide additional funds that may be needed for the family to cover those utility deposits that are so important, such as those required for gas, electricity, and or water. So very quickly, I've talked about shelter payments, the ability to meet folks' needs, to be able to have a place to sleep at night, that's temporary homeless assistance. And I've also talked about permanent homeless assistance, which is provides families with their needs uh, to pay for those security deposit costs and the ability to have their utilities turned on through uh, payments for utility turn on fees. I want to talk about some of the exclusions because I know that sometimes these kind of do come up. The permit tape payment cannot cover the first month's rent and it cannot pay for overdue, overdue utility bills. And things like purchase, uh, like things like the purchase of a stove and a refrigerator. I'll talk about other benefits that can pay for those, but I wanted to make a clear distinction about it. Just like the temporary shelter benefit that I talked about, this particular benefit is available every 12 months, meaning that if a family becomes homeless again, even though they may have used the benefit before, if they were to become homeless again, they do have an access point to this benefit one more time, provided that at least 12 months have gone by from when they first started receiving homeless assistance. And that day actually starts counting from the day they receive their first payment of the shelter payments. 
So it's not from the last benefit issue. Just want to make sure we clarify that because it's very, very important. Key rule though that I have to mention and that I have to make sure we cover is that for the permanent homeless assistance payment, the rent amount cannot exceed 80% of the family's total monthly household income. That's one of the requirements under this particular benefit. So it can be challenging with, with uh, folks who have low income and so forth and things like that, but it is a rule for it for the particular benefit. I'm going to go ahead and transition over to the arrearages component of permanent homeless assistance. Critical thing to realize is that although the permanent homeless assistance payment can be used to help a homeless family to pay for security, deposit costs, and utility turn-on fees, it can also be utilized if a family is facing eviction. If a family is behind in rent due to a valid financial hardship and they've received a notice from their landlord, such as a pay rent or quit, uh, that's caused by some uh, form of a financial hardship, caused by something out of their control, the permanent homeless assistance or just payment is a very good fit because instead of um, waiting for a family to enter homelessness, perhaps we can intervene ahead of time on the prevention side. And if we could issue a payment that covers up to two months rent to get the family uh, back to speed to where they are at, that's a great intervention. One of the challenges though to the arrearages payment is that rent must be within 80% of the family's total monthly household income. I will speak about an alternative to this in just a bit. It's called the Emergency Assistance to Prevent Eviction Program, but I just want to quickly mention that the 80% rule is still there for the PERM component. That can be challenging, especially when folks are behind in rent due to a hardship. So I want to make that very clear. Um, Again, this particular benefit, the eviction uh, component of it is limited, again, since it's a state program, it's available every 12 months. And I will talk about exceptions a little bit down further down the presentation. Key thing is I want to make clear that the arrearages payment under the state cannot pay for past due utility bills. It's specific to being, to on, uh, being only available to pay for rent. Okay. I've uh, quickly talked about the state program, the homeless assistance program. I've talked about the shelter payments. I've spoken about the permanent homeless assistance payment that I call to get a place, security, deposit cost, utility, turn on fees. And I also quickly mentioned the arrear just component, which is to help families to keep a place. And that would cover up to two months back to your rent. I'd like to segue now into the county programs. Earlier before I mentioned that, these programs are in addition to the uh, program that's available at the state level. In a lot of ways, they're designed to supplement the state program as we know it. So the first one I'm gonna talk about is called the Temporary Homeless Assistance Program Plus 14. I wanted to mention that because uh, Plus 14 is kind of a, a, a critical thing. We call this a supplemental program. Why? Because it provides an additional 14 days basically families that are um, engaged in the gain welfare to work program. So at the state level, uh, I spoke about 16 consecutive days. Temporary, the TAP plus 14 provides an additional 14 days to supplement what is available under the state program. So uh, key difference here is that they do not have to be issued consecutively, unlike the state program. So that's kind of where you see a, a difference there. The state does ask, uh, does ask that it has to be consecutive, so 16 consecutive days. When you're looking at the TAP plus 14 program, uh, the 14 days do not have to be issued consecutively. Typically, we'll do a one-week issuance followed up by another one-week issuance. And that's, uh, that's very good because in general, what that does provide is some flexibility uh, depending on the needs of the family, uh, not having to use it, use it consecutively, that is. So, it supplements the state's program. Now, let's really talk about the, the rates. It's the same daily rates that would be available under the state's temporary homeless assistance payment. So the range there, again, is $85 per day for a family of you know four or less inside uh, what we call the assistance unit. And it provides an additional $15 for each additional member up to a max, again, of $145 per day. The next payment, um, I want to talk about the next program. We call this our Moving Assistance Program. 
So earlier I talked about the state homeless assistance program and the permanent homeless assistance payment. Moving assistance is, is very similar in a lot of ways to that permanent shape payment because ultimately what it does is it helps families to secure permanent housing. If a family has already exhausted the state program, meaning that maybe 12 months hasn't go, gone by, uh, and uh, they became homeless again, and they can't yet connect to the moving assistance, I mean, I'm sorry, to the PERM program, moving assistance provides a viable opportunity if the family is enrolled in the GAIN program. Key difference here is that it provides a payment of up to $2,500, and again, to secure permanent housing, and it's available to welfare-to-work families who are homeless, first and foremost, but also to folks who are at risk of becoming homeless. I want to make that key distinction. Um, where we look at the state program, homelessness is a key criteria, but moving assistance is a bit more flexible. And what I mean by that, let's say you have a family who uh, is at risk of homelessness, and what I mean by that is their rent is just unaffordable. Moving assistance is a good intervention because even though the family has not entered homelessness, perhaps it makes sense to help relocate the family and move them to somewhere more affordable. And this is kind of where you see moving assistance being more flexible than what the state would do. The state would say, well, if they're not homeless, we can't, there's no access point. With moving assistance, there is an access point. If you have a first time recipient of section eight, again, wonderful benefit for that, because it's really, we would much rather help a family secure section eight housing due to the affordable uh, nature of it. And we would love to be able to help with the funds they need for security deposits, utility turn on fees and so forth. Key thing about moving assistance that's a bit different too from the state program is I know it can, you know, like we talked about security deposits, it could cover the last month's rent, cleaning fees, key deposits. It could also cover utility deposits. But in addition to that, something a bit different. If they need a truck rental to move stuff out of storage, that's an added benefit at the county level here with MA. That's not available at the state level. And in addition to that, it, it can provide up to $405 for this purchase of a stove and or refrigerator when the place doesn't have one. So sometimes when somebody secures Section 8, sometimes uh, I know $405 is not exactly a lot, lot, but sometimes we find options out there through our homeless case managers where maybe they can buy used equipment or something like that. And we have made many successful uh, purchases that way through our moving assistance program. Not a bad fit for your Section 8 situ situation, by the way. I also want to talk about our emergency assistance to prevent eviction program. Earlier, I spoke about the arrearages payment at the state level, and I mentioned very quickly the key challenge. When somebody is going through a hardship, income is reduced. And sometimes meeting the 80% rule is a real tough thing to do. So at DPSS, we have our EAP program. That's the Emergency Assistance to Prevent Eviction Program. This program does not have the 80% rule. So that's uh, really good in terms of providing an access point, providing an alternative or maybe a benefit at the state level cannot be accessed for whatever reason. At DPSS, we develop programs with alternative access point to continue the continuum as much as we can to assist our families. So what does EAPE do? It provides a payment to folks that are at risk. Again, we it has, they have to be behind in rent, and it has a one-time limit of, a, I'm sorry, a once-in-a-lifetime maximum of $3,000. Now, that can be used as needed. Some folks sometimes come in and ask for an intervention when they're not that behind their rent. We actually prefer that before they really start getting a lot of negative history. We want to intervene. So even if they don't use all the $3,000 in the first payment, it will still be available to them to come back and access whatever balance is needed. So I wanted to be very clear about that. Sometimes folks do connect to the entire amount in one shot, which is not unreasonable, but I wanted to put that out there. This one also can pay for past due, not only the past due rent, but also utilities. Um, sometimes folks are behind in their utilities. It's the nature of a hardship. When our families suffer from a hardship, things start to happen and start uh, people start to get behind on, on not only the rent, but also their utilities. So I wanted to be clear that this benefit can also intervene on the on the utility side, something that you don't see at the state level. I'm just trying to give you a quick uh, contrast and comparison, state versus the county program. Quickly, 
wanted to mention our four month rental assistance program. Um, it's, it's a short, it's a short term rental subsidy. It provides a range anywhere from $400 to a maximum of $500 per month. For a maximum of four consecutive months, I'll talk about extending that a little bit in just a bit, but I just by design the program is developed at four months. If a family is enrolled in our Welfare to Work Family Stabilization Program at the gain level, I want to mention that that's a wonderful program uh, because not only can a family uh, experience the benefits of stabilizing their situation, but they can also now stretch out their four months of rental subsidy to a total of eight consecutive months. So that's like you're doubling the, the number of amount, amounts of months that are available at the under the rental assistance program by virtue of participating in this family stabilization program. And it only makes sense because whenever a family is exiting homelessness or whether they're trying to get stabilized after being at risk, a subsidy can be very important in helping the family stabilize. So I wanted to quickly mention, in addition to that, um, what population can access this subsidy because it's really important. If we have a family who we've helped through our state program, like to get a place, security deposit, the turn on fees, the subsidy will be a perfect complement to help the family stabilize. After being formerly homeless, we can do four months, and if they're in the welfare to work family stabilization program, that can go up to eight months. The other thing I wanted to mention is that's not the only access point. If we have intervened at DPSS um, by uh, issuing a payment for eviction prevention, whether it be the Perm HA arrearages payment or whether it be the EAPE program payment, which I just discussed, again, this is yet another access point to our rental assistance program. So two ways uh, a family can be connected to our subsidy would be if they were homeless, and we issued, we issued funds to help them get a place. That's one way to get the subsidy. The other way would be is if they receive DPSS administered eviction prevention funds, that would be another access point to our rental subsidy. Keeping again as a reminder, anybody who's participating in that gain component, the family stabilization component, they will be able to access the additional uh, months under this particular benefit. I wanted to quickly mention, just giving you this table here so everybody can see, I talked about the range anywhere from four to $500. Um, just wanted to give the quick breakout so everybody would know specifically where, uh, depending on the family size, where, uh, what amount they would receive under the subsidy. I wanna talk about exceptions real quick because this is where I wanna teach you guys a little more about just uh, more, more on access points to some of these programs. It's really an important thing. The programs that allow for an exception, uh, and, uh, what is an exception? Basically, the word exception means, I talked about like program limits and things like that. So I talked about the state program being available once a year, but the program also has exceptions to that rule, meaning that if family, depending on why they became homeless or the need for additional homeless assistance, they can access benefits yet again anywhere within that 12 month period that's established for the state program. Key words is domestic violence, mental or physical illness of somebody in the family and assistance unit member or prior residence becoming an inhabitable or natural disaster. These are key access points to exception. The programs which recognize and allow for the exceptions are the state program. Remember the one I said, every 12 months? Well, now we can expand that. Expand that. We could say comma with exceptions. So if the family became homeless because they're suffering domestic violence, mental or physical illness, or their prior residence become uninha became uninhabitable, these are ways, or a natural disaster, these are ways that they can get additional either shelter payments or an additional, well, typically additional shelter payments. So what would be limited to 16 consecutive days if a family is homeless because of domestic violence or mental or physical illness, we could issue another 16 days for a total of 32 in that particular type of example. Uh, I wanna mention those programs that do not have exceptions built in, and that is our emergency assistance to prevent eviction program. That has the $3,000 limit. 
again, to, can be used as needed until that limit is reached. And the other program that has the limits is our four-month rental assistance program. Again, that program can be accessed when a family uh, gets a place after being homeless or if the family is facing eviction and we issue a DPSS funds to prevent that eviction, that's another access point to our four-month rental assistance program. But let's not forget up to eight months if family stabilization component is existing on this family. Okay, I want to quickly mention that we do have homeless case. Uh, uh, we do have a homeless case management program um, that translates to having homeless case managers at every CalWORKs DPSS office. It's uh, currently it is a voluntary program meaning that the uh, fa we refer uh, families when they come and ask for benefits or they identify as homeless we try our best to connect them to our homeless case management program but it is a voluntary program we do our best to make our referrals to them and to make those connections uh, and again we have um, homeless case managers assigned to every tower district office and the, not only see uh, folks who are homeless, but also those that are at risk of homelessness. I just wanted to make sure I made that clear. The key goal of the Homeless Case Management Program is to conduct an assessment and to determine the appropriate services for uh, that the CalWORKs homeless or at risk family uh, may, um, is experiencing is to also facilitate access to services. So very critical for us at DPSS is that coordination piece because we have uh, workers at the gain level, we have workers at the eligibility level, and then we have several things going on. So the ATM is a critical component of that in terms of helping to coordinate access to those workers or to try to resolve things that are going on in the case. So that's, uh, they play a very important role, role to that particular, um, to, to our families when we're going for that. I wanted to quickly make sure that everybody's aware of our homeless services website this is available on at uh, dpss.org and uh, if you go under homeless services you will see uh, we have all of the fact sheets on the programs that i've discussed today with more in-depth information and we also have a link on this website uh, it's called e-policy where somebody would basically click on there and if you they were curious about specifics about the state program and a specific policy. All that policy is available online. I love to refer people to this part of the website because if you click on enough times and you start checking, you can become pretty familiar with the various uh, homeless benefits and services that we have at DPSS. Now, before I totally hand uh, the next, um, or to the next presenter, I want to kind of tail off by saying that any, how do we connect folks to these benefits? I know I talked about a lot of them. These benefits, um, the family would have to apply at the particular CalWORKs office. Now, it doesn't have to be the CalWORKs office that they are a particular, their cases is assigned to. We have a no wrong door policy at DPSS. So it can be whatever office is most convenient for the family. Uh, that may be their current worker, if that is what works for the family, but I wanted to make it clear. Uh, they'd have to go into the office and they'd have to let uh, them know that they want to see their worker. And uh, that's the first getting started to getting connected to these homeless programs and services. Um, quick thing before, because I know we're going to be starting uh, a discussion on the coordinated entry system for families and so forth, but I wanted to quickly kind of mention that at DPSS, we do everything we can to try and assist our families who are homeless or at risk for any of the benefits that I've talked to about today. If a family has a need for shelter, we will connect them to the state program, temporary HA or the TAP plus 14. If we're looking at eviction, we'll do everything we can for EAPE or the arrearages payment at the state level. But if we find ourselves in a spot where uh, the benefits are not available or maybe the family has exhausted the benefit, I just wanted to let you know that our ATMs, the ones that I talked to, are the folks that would initiate a referral to one of the family solution centers that are a part of our coordinated entry system for families here in LA County. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, uh, that concludes this part of the, I'm now looking for questions, I believe. Yes, and Laurel, could you take over that section? The next uh, yes. question? Yeah. 
Yes, uh, we got three questions that came through. The first question is, are families able to access the temporary housing assistance program with Airbnb? And that was a question from Alexa. Very good question. Uh, yes, uh, I would say it, that's a definite. I think that as we start going um, forward in terms of technology and options and how tough it is to find an establishment that may be affordable, establishment, what I mean is like a hotel or motel, Yes, we can. Uh, they can stay at an Airbnb, and it would be okay since they are using it for shelter. As far as I'm concerned, that's a that's a commercial type of establishment. It's a business, so yes. First question. Great. The first. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, the next question is: Can DPSS service immigrant families that may not be eligible for CalWORKs? I like to put it this way. Um, no, I mean, it's not exactly, I, I, that sounds really rough in saying it no, but look at it this way. I wouldn't look at it that way. Look at it as they can receive a payment on behalf of a child. So when we talked about like the, I can segue this, I mean, I will always say they're simply not eligible at that, what we started with the question, but their children are. So that's really a great way to look at this. When you're looking at shelter payments, we're not going to subtract. We're not going to do anything like it. So if a family needs to access the state program, they need shelter payments. I talked about the $85 rate. They would get the $85 rate. We would not take away from that. Likewise, when we looked at permanent homeless assistance, yes, maybe the parent or mom is not. They don't have the status. But the children, there's children to think about here. It is CalWORKs, California Work Opportunity and Responsibility to Kids program. And with that said, Definitely, those parents, even though it's a no, they can receive payments on behalf of those children. Great, I thank you. The second one. Um, okay, um, one other question is, can families that receive different forms of government assistance, such as SSI, seek the services at a DPSS office, or are there other options? Families who receive other types of services, I'm a little lost on the question. I'm trying to figure it out. Is that, repeat it one more time, please. Okay. Um, families that receive different forms of government assistance, such as SSI, seek the services at a DPSS office, or are there other options? No, I mean, just answer the, que uh, the question as simply as possible. If a family has a specific need that is not being met by another government agency, we at DPSL more than welcome the family to come to one of our offices to see what may be available. Great, thank you. Yeah, Okay. Sure. Um, yeah. Do you have time for one more? Sure. Okay, um, if you are working with a homeless case management rep, should you still go to a family solution center or should you get help through the CES for families? I think it depends on each family specific needs. I mean, that sounds like a very global uh, response. At DPSS, I kind of started off and I mentioned it very quickly. At DPSS, if there's anything we could do in terms of like the shelter payments and if uh, through our ATM program or maybe the fi family finds a place they'd like to rent and the benefits are available, we, were inter we will do everything we can to intervene at DPSS to not even make the referral into the coordinated entry system. We'd like to resolve it at DPSS. It's only when uh, for some reason, maybe the family used it or there's not enough income or some sort of barrier there that we would initiate the referral to the coordinated entry system for families, which really is the Family Solution Centers for us. Okay, thank you. And then lastly, just uh, one quick comment. If you would be able to send us the direct link to the DPSS Homeless website, I can share it with everybody that is on this call. That's a 10-4, I got it, sure. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. De La Torre. And now we will uh, move right along with our presentation. And Laura Diego from LASA will now um, give us some background information about LASA. And then we'll move right into uh, discussing the role of the Family Solution Center. And we have the whole child here with us today to share about their services. Laura? Good morning. Uh, we are setting up the, uh, slide, the slides just now. 
Um, just wanted to introduce myself. I'm Lori Diego, and I am the family coordinator for LASA, and um, I am um, tasked with being the family coordinator for uh, one, two, three, and seven. But in, you know, uh, our, my contact information will be made available um, at the end of um, the slideshow. So feel free to send me any questions that may come up after the fact. Okay, great. So let me go ahead and go on to the next one. I uh, want to introduce you to LASA, uh, which is the Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority, uh, which was created in 1993. And um, it is governed by joint powers by both the city and the county. Uh, the mission uh, for us is to support, create, and sustain solutions for homelessness in Los Angeles County by providing the leadership, advocacy, planning, and management of um, program funding. So one of the things that I think people forget is that LASA is not a direct service provider, but really we are a funder. Uh, we fund programs throughout the county. We seem to have lost your PowerPoint screen. Hold on one second. We're back on. Thank you for your patience, everyone. Laura, we can see your PowerPoint slides now. I believe we're having some difficulty with the audio. Laura, we are not able to hear you. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes. Hello? Yes. Okay, great. Yes. All right, let's move great. forward. Um, uh, LASA is the lead agency for the continuum of care for Los Angeles County, and they currently administer 130, over $132 million of federal, state, county, and city funds to provide shelter, health, and homeless services throughout LA County and LA City. We currently partner with over 100 uh, nonprofit agencies to provide um, outreach, access centers, emergency shelter, safe havens, which include like winter shelters, permanent housing, and homeless prevention programs, and any of the supportive services that are needed for our homeless neighbors. Uh, LASA also uh, works in conjunction with other city and county agencies uh, to help plan and implement uh, some of the homeless strategies. Uh, one of the things that LASA has been really uh, working with is uh, trying to leverage other. We apologize, we're having some audio difficulties. Um, I'm sure um, our colleagues are trying to figure out the problem and we'll be back shortly. Laura, I think you might have muted yourself. Oh wait, now you should be okay. No, are you are you there? No, it w no. Yeah, we can hear you now. Okay, you can hear me. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, I can we get on to the next slide?
Okay, great. All right. Every, every time we switch slides, it starts to unmute us or to mute us. Thank you for your patience, everyone. We're having a bit of a difficulty with the audio, um, but we are trying to oh, fix the problem, and we'll be right back. There we go. Wait, wait. Okay. I think we're ready. Great. Can we get? Can we go ahead and get started? Yes. Okay. Great. And you can hear me. Okay. Great. Um, Lothar follows the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development uh, definition of homelessness. And we know that uh, some of the homeless definitions across all county programs and or different agencies don't align, but a uh, lot is held to the standard of the HUD definition. So a homeless person is any uh, individual who lacks a fixed, regular, or adequate nighttime residence meaning that, um, you know, uh, the individual uh, has, does not, it's currently sleeping or staying in a place that's either public or private, not designated for regular uh, sleeping accommodation for human beings. Uh, that would be include a car, park, um, a park, an abandoned building, maybe even a um, unpermitted unit uh, maybe a train station, an airport, a, or a campground. Uh, an individual who also is living in a supervised publicly or privately operated shelter that's de designated to provide temporary living arrangements would be considered someone who is currently homeless. That, that it also includes uh, congregate shelters, transitional housing, motels that are paid by a sh uh, charitable organization or a federal or state or local government program. Uh, an individual who is exiting an institution where he or she has been for over uh, for 90 days or less and who resides or in an emergency shelter or a place not meant for human habitation. Okay, great. Um, the head definition, um, also uh, people need to belong to one of the following categories. An, indiv an individual who will immediately lose their primary time, uh, their primary nighttime residence, so someone who is currently at risk, someone who will be losing their place where they are staying within 14 days, uh, someone who has no subsequent residence that has been identified, maybe someone who has lost their place and now has nowhere to go, or an individual who lacks a resource or a support network, such as family or friends, or church or faith-based uh, agency that might be able to provide them with permanent housing. Okay, uh, there's all, also uh, the HUD definition for homelessness. Also, uh, the person needs to belong to one of the following categories. Someone who is fleeing or is attempting to flee domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assault, stalking, or another dangerous or life-threatening condition that is related to violence against an individual that has either taken place in the person's primary nighttime residence or has made it difficult for that person to return because they are in fear for their life. Uh, someone who has no other residence or someone who lacks the resources of, you know, of a support system like family, friends, or a church, or other social network. Okay. Uh, someone who is considered chronically homeless, and you've heard that 
you've probably heard that definition because a lot of uh, programs, county programs require that someone is chronically homeless. So in order to meet the definition of chronically homeless is a person who uh, is homeless and lives in a place or lives in a place that's not meant for habitation or a safe haven or in an emergency shelter and has been homeless or living in one of these locations for at least 12 months or at least in four separate occasions has been homeless in the last three years where those occasions cumulatively add up to at least 12 months and C can be diagnosed with one or more of the following conditions. Uh, they either have a substance abuse disorder, a mental health illness, a developmental disability, or they have post-traumatic stress disorder, a cognitive impairment resulting from a brain injury or a chronic uh, physical illness or disability. So HUD defines chronic homelessness as an individual who has been residing in a in institutional care facility that could be a jail, a substance abuse or mental health treatment facility or hospital or other type of uh, facility for less than 90 days and meets the criteria in uh, paragraph one or a family uh, with an adult as the head of household or if there's no adult in the family, the minor head of household who meets the criteria in paragraph one, uh, including families whose composition has fluctuated while the, uh, the head of household has been homeless. Please note that if someone is currently in a drug or rehab uh, residential treatment program they, uh, for um, longer than 90 days, they can lose their, homeless chron uh, their chronically homeless status, which can impact their eligibility for certain programs. So it's always uh, good to keep this definition in mind. Uh, also know that recovery bridge housing is equivalent to a shelter program. And therefore, if it's a bridge housing type program, they would maintain their chronic eligibility. Okay, um, the, so let's talk a little bit about uh, some of the leading causes of homelessness. As Robert mentioned earlier, uh, the homeless count just came out um, this last month. And uh, currently, LA County experienced a 12% increase in homelessness. And in the city of LA, we experienced a 16% increase. Um, families, uh, we saw a smaller, but yet still significant increase of 6.4%, where um, our youth uh, increased by 24% and our seniors, uh, 8%. So currently, um, we do have uh, just shy of 60,000 uh, unsheltered uh, homeless people in our county. Um, some of the leading causes for our homelessness is the insufficient income and lack of affordable housing. Um, people are just being squeezed out of the housing market. The other thing is that right now, um, uh, the county is, uh, in a, in a study, they've determined that we need over 500,000 units to be able to meet the current needs of our homeless neighbors. Um, the um, National Law Center for homeless, uh, Homelessness and Poverty has identified the five leading causes of homelessness. Uh, that includes the lack of affordable housing, unemployment or underemployment, uh, poverty, mental illness, uh, or a lot of lack of services for our mentally um, challenged and also uh, substance abuse um, as those are some of the leading causes. Uh, currently, um, only 29% of the people who are homeless report having a mental illness or a substance abuse problem. So it's a really small portion in you know, consideration of all the total number. So homelessness looks different uh, for everybody, but it's really um, difficult to know just from uh, looking at the different populations. Um, so I think you really have to have a good connection and some progressive engagement with the um, person who's identified as being homeless to really know which system is the best one to serve the family. I mean, to the individual's needs. 
Okay, so we're going to talk about the coordinated entry system. And so the coordinated entry system, or the CES as it's known, uh, brings together new and existing programs and all of the resources into one central location to be able to determine which is the best uh, housing or services to help that homeless individual or family. Uh, prior to uh, having the CES, there was a lot of people and the system was not really mainstream. Now, currently with CES, we have, uh, we have a segue for people who are currently experiencing homelessness with housing resources that are funneled through the CES so that people could be matched up to the most appropriate uh, intervention for families or individuals. So this is the pathway that uh, we are currently utilizing in our in LA County uh, to towards meeting the needs uh, of homeless individuals and families towards uh, permanent housing. So as you see, uh, there are, and they, we start off with access, we move on to assessment, then prioritization, matching, and permanent housing. When people start to come into the system, they are trying to access the system, and that could be through many ways. Uh, people can come in and uh, get a referral into one of the CES providers, at which time they will um, send a referral. Just know that problem solving is an intervention that is utilized, and that is our first line of defense. We like to uh, empower our uh, participants to, uh, to try to help them identify existing resources that they may have or uh, other county resources to, uh, to resolve their uh, housing crisis. One of the things is that despite the money that has become available and the number of programs that have been created, the reality is that the need is greater than the resources available. So problem solving is an intervention that we will try to use throughout the continuum to try to get them to resolve their permanent housing needs. Um, so when we talk about the, all of the population, we see that you can have, um, although we have a system for families, for single adults, and for, for tr transitional age youth, there's always the possibility that they're going to overlap. And identifying the appropriate um, agency to provide the services is very important. But the CES does have the no wrong door. So should, you, uh, should a participant or a family come into a system and they're not the right fit, then the policy is that they're supposed to be a warm handoff to the appropriate agency that may be able to better serve the families. As we talked earlier, um, everybody is um, very interested in identifying how uh, pregnant women uh, can get services uh, through the CES. Um, it used to be that uh, if a pregnant woman did not have any other dependent children, she was considered a single adult until their third trimester. That is no longer the case. Uh, pregnant women can be served under the single system and or the family system. They will have to provide proof of pregnancy and they can work with their CES provider to be able to get that proof to them in a timely manner. Um, but if, let's say, we might have a single woman who is pregnant and maybe she might be 20 years old. She might be able to be served through the Tate population, through the Tate system, through the single system, or through the family system. So depending on that particular individual's needs, that's how um, it is determined which agency might be better for them. It is very likely that if you have a transitional age youth uh, uh, young person who is currently pregnant, she the benefits uh, might be greater for her if she stays in the transitional age youth uh, age, uh, with a pay provider and maybe transition into a family system maybe later, uh, depending on where, what the resources are at the time. So it's really important to have really a good conversation with the CES to just make that determination. And all of the CES um, providers within the spots all work together and they meet regularly to uh, transfer, consult, 
and do the warm handoff of families. Okay, uh, some of the resources through the CES that we'll go over. Um, as you may have seen out in the community, we do have about 300 outreach team members that go out into the community and they, um, their goal is to locate, identify, and build relationships with individuals and families who are currently homeless, who are out on the street, engage them and try to link them to services, especially to the CES lead agency, uh, so that they could get connected to services. Um, problem solving, uh, as I stated earlier, is a strategy which we are implementing throughout the county, uh, also known as diversion or rapid resolution. And it's a response, it's a crisis response philosophy and approach uh, where we are supporting families who are currently experiencing housing instability to quickly identify and access alternative housing resources outside of the CES. Uh, problem solving supports families in identifying other options by doing very light touch um, and limited financial assistance when necessary to ensure that we, you know, if we can prevent them from falling into the homeless system. We also do prevention. Uh, prevention is for families who are currently at risk. And if a family is just, um, for whatever reason, uh, fell behind on their rent, and it is a lot more cost effective for us to catch them up on their rent and provide limited financial assistance to maintain their housing. And for those individuals who already have lost their housing and are currently homeless, we do provide housing navigation. And housing navigation is housing services that are complemented by intensive case management, um, linking them to uh, resources that, uh, that might help them to increase their income, helping them identify housing, uh, other resources to ensure that the ultimate goal is to get their own place and getting them housed. Okay, uh, some of the core components of the CES is that we uh, will do an assessment uh, based on the assessment, the families will be prioritized for services. Uh, we will provide housing navigation, helping them identify uh, housing uh, that are appropriate for their particular situation. We will link them to supportive services and match, match them to permanent supportive housing resources if deemed necessary. And also provide housing stabilization and retention because one of the things that we want to make sure is that we safeguard all of our hard work and ensure that the families are stable and able to maintain their new residences. Okay, so with that being said, uh, I can take uh, questions about the CES, but do keep in mind that the whole child staff will be able to uh, provide you more in-depth uh, details as to what happens once they are actually connected to the Family Solutions Center. Hi, Laura. We had one question come through for you. Uh, and this Wait. question is, uh, will verbal statements of a family's homelessness suffice as proof when assessing eligibility for assistance? Okay. So we, yeah, yeah. During the screening, that is sufficient. Once uh, they uh, make a, a contact with the, the Family Solutions Centers or the CES, they will want to uh, secure either a third party verification. Maybe uh, they have a documentation where maybe they got a pay or quit or an eviction notice that that would, you know, that can be brought in as documentation. And then in cases where there is absolutely no way to get a verification, there is a uh, form that can be pr uh, prepared by the participant for self-declaration. Great, thank you moving, so much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We are moving towards some less barriers for uh, participants. So, um, yes, so, you know, when, if there's any question about that, you can always contact your DEF lead and they would be able to provide further guidance on what most, what's best for that particular person's um, situation. Okay, I'm great. Gonna go ahead and, um, okay, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over 
and um, the whole child would take on from here. Thank you. Um, I just want to reintroduce our representatives from the whole child. Uh, we have Silvia Trenteria and Janine Solorio. Please go ahead. Hi, good morning, everyone. My name is Silvia Trenteria. I am the regional coordinator for families in SPA 7, specifically working with the whole child. So I want to start by um, adding to what Laura said about the coordinated entry system. Um, the coordinated entry system has eight family solution centers in the county, and they are divided by spots. Um, as you can see in the map, um, we are spot seven in East Los Angeles, and we are the whole child. But every single spot has its own family solution center that can serve as the families in, in their area, so that families don't have to, tra to travel far to be able to access services. Um, as family solution centers and CES providers, uh, if, uh, when a family access the program or when the family access services, we're always going to do a screening. And we are going to try to problem solve, as Laura was explaining. If problem solving is successful, we are, uh, and the family is able to stay in, in a home. Um, then, that is a, then that is a successful house family for us. If not, if we cannot find another, solution, another temporary solution for the family, we are going to bring them into a program where we, where we are going to um, look for, for permanent, permanent housing for them. And I'll go into more details um, further in the presentation of how that works. Um, we received families from referrals from 211, from the LASA Homeless and Engagement Team. This is a team that's out in the streets every day looking for families and, and or neighbors experiencing homelessness to, to offer them the services that are in the CES. We also receive uh, phone calls, self referrals, walkings, a lot of referrals from partner agencies, um, school districts, and cities. When, fam when families are calling, we are mainly looking for three things to see if they qualify for a program in the, in the Family Solutions Center. So first, we're looking if the family is experiencing homelessness or if they are at risk of becoming homeless. We also have income guidelines. That's something that we're going to assess in the first point of contact. And we're also going to see if they meet the definition of a family. Like Laura explained before, we have a no wrong door policy. So if we receive a call from a in single individual or a tape, we're going to also provide the specific agency they need to go to and, and do a warm handoff. A family is considered any parent or guardian with a minor under the age of 17, a pregnant woman in any trimester. If they don't have any other dependent children with, the, with them, we, were, we are going to, prov to ask that they provide proof of pregnancy for us in order to access services. Um, we are not going to ask it on the first day as we are a low barrier program, but we are going to work with the family or the, of the, or the pro pregnant women to get the proof of pregnancy. We also work with families with dependent adults. Um, maybe they are receiving SSI, maybe they have a disability, and a qualified dependent is over the age of 18 who is one and capable of self-sustaining employment by reason of mental or physical disability, and B is chiefly dependent upon the head of household for support and maintenance, and is eligible to receive services under the CES for families. For that, we will require that they provide us uh, with verification, maybe SSI paperwork, and or a letter from a medical professional saying that the, that the dependent adult is an incapable of working and, and has to depend on the head of household. We follow the homeless definition um, of HUD. So this is something that Laura already went over. But again, we are going to look at the family staying in a place not meant for habitation um, or is at risk of becoming homeless. 
We are, we are also able to service those families that are fleeing or attempting to flee domestic violence. However, at this point, we'll work closely together with the DV system to see what is the system that better fits and that will better fit the needs of the family uh, because the, the, the CES is not able to protect the family's um, safety because our, our shelters do not have police um, that, that is able to, to protect the family. So if that is the case, if the family cannot protect themselves, we will refer to the DV system. Now, how do we know if the, if the family where where do we know the fam how do we know the family belongs to a certain spot? Well, we're gonna ask three main questions. Where was your last what was your last permanent address, your last zip code, where is your employment, and where is your where is your children's school located? We want to keep the families close to their community of origin and, and especially the children. We want them to continue going to their to their same school to at least provide some stability. Um, if we cannot find a significant tie by asking those three questions, then we are going to see where is the family receiving mainstream services, such as DPSS, um, DMH, um, CPH, and, and, and stuff like that. Again, after we ask those questions, then if the family says, well, I'm living in Lancaster, for example, then we are going to refer to, to spa one, value ACES, because that's the closest family solution center to them. In this chart, I am show, I, we are show, showing the cities that belong to each service planning area, um, specifically spa seven services the east and southeast region of Los Angeles, um, anywhere from some areas of East Chile all the way to La Mirada and Lakewood. Um, However, as you can see in the, in the chart, um, other service planning areas serve as those cities. We, when we send this PowerPoint, you'll be able to see which family solution service area uh, best fits the needs of your family. When we find that a family, that a family uh, belongs to another spa, we are going to do a warm um, referral or a warm transfer. Remember, there's a no wrong door policy. This is a referral that we fill out, and this is a referral that you can also fill out yourself um, because it's a general referral for every family solution center. At the top, you can see that all of the family solution centers are listed. Uh, we are the whole child spa seven. But after you look at the chart previously shown and you see, well, my family is in Lancaster. I need to refer them to Value Aces. You can check that box um, and email the referral to the email listed there. We don't need a lot of information. It's very basic. So what is the head of household's name, contact number, the number of people in the household, their total monthly income, and the age of the children. That is the top portion. And in the bottom, tell us a little bit about the family. Maybe the family has identified permanent housing and they just need, need moving assistance. Maybe the family is literally homeless and in, in need of crisis housing. Um, maybe the family is at risk of becoming homeless. And then just tell us a little bit about your agency and who can we contact in case we don't, in case we need to contact you back. In the bottom, you can also give us a little bit of more information. Maybe what is their current housing situation, maybe their plan, or if they have specific language needs. As Laura mentioned, throughout the county, we're implementing something that we call problem solving. And this is a strategy that we'll use with any family that is, that is calling um, the Family Solution Center. We believe that families have probably been through a rough situation in the past as well, or through a crisis. And believe it or not, they have been able to resolve their crisis in the past. So we want to empower families and take a, a little bit of time with them on the phone or in, or in person to see who is in your support system. Do you have an uncle? Do you have a coworker? Do you have a family or friend that can maybe let you stay there? Um, we also go into details of how the, the housing market looks like. What is the price? 
and able to really guide the family on what are their long-term goals, not really what they need at that moment. And, and maybe how can we guide the family so that they can work on their long-term goals and not just what they need in that moment. So again, um, it's not that we are denying services from them. We're really looking at the family to see what do they really need at that time and is that going to help them to, towards their long-term goals and see if they have um, any resources. Again, problem solving is not a barrier, barrier to shelter. So if a family is really in need, they are literally on the street and they have no other resources and we're going to do everything possible to be able to secure um, a place for them to stay. At the whole child specifically, now every family solution center has the rapid rehousing program and the homeless prevention program, but they might, they might, have, not, um, they might have more services. Um, and different services than other family solution centers. Um, specifically, again, at the whole child, we have the rapid rehousing program, which is for literally homeless families. Again, those who are in the streets, in the park, in the shelter, in a place not meant for habitation. And in a nutshell, what it does, we provide case management and housing navigation in short to medium term financial assistance to assist the family to move into an uh, an apartment or in a, to a place of their own. The homeless prevention program is for families that are at risk. Maybe they received a three-day notice, an unlawful detainer, um, they're behind on their rent two, three months because maybe their car broke down, maybe they had some unexpected medical in, um, expenses, and now they just need a little push to be able to, to, to continue to sustain their rent. Um, that is the homeless prevention program, again, is very short term. Um, for the rapid rehousing program, because the need is so high, and Laura just, just told us about the homeless count numbers, we also have to do prioritization. So um, when a family calls us, we have, um, we, we bring them in, and, and when a family calls us and they qualify for one of the CES programs, we bring them in to do what we call the VI expedite. And, and it, it is an, assess, an assessment that is used throughout the county. Um, and that is used to prioritize a family. So that, this is where we look at the family's barriers, family size, do they have any mental health needs, any substance abuse, um, any disabilities in the family? Have they been in the criminal justice system? Um, all, all of the barriers that the family has, the higher the family scores, the faster we're gonna bring them into a program. So the VI for that ranges from zero to 22. Any family that scores above nine, we consider them a red family or a high risk family. So those are the families that will access the, the program um, faster than other families that maybe don't have in, um, a lot of barriers. Maybe they can access a family member. Um, they are not as at risk as the other family. Um, and just just a quick note, when somebody says send the referral, they are sent to the email provided on the referral sheet, and we have 48 hours to contact the family back. Um, as soon as we contact the family, they will know based on that phone call if there is a program available to them um, or if there is not a program available at that time. Already, everyone. So once a family has been assessed and we have identified that they are in fact in the appropriate um, this family solutions uh, center, then we are able to um, go ahead and enroll them in the rapid rehousing program if they are deemed eligible. And the services that are um, provided in the rapid rehousing program, we do a screening and an assessment um, with the family. We schedule an intake with them. And at the, at the point of intake, if the family is literally homeless, meaning living in a place not meant for human habitation, if for whatever reason um, they are needing crisis housing shelter, depending on the availability of a family solution center, they are able to provide those resources. Um, and in addition, while they are in the rapid rehousing program, we are doing housing navigation. So what housing navigation looks for for families is we're providing them linkages um, to any, um, any facilities or any agencies that they're needing services for. If the family 
um, express needing new birth certificates, then we're able to refer them to the agency that will be able to assist them with that. If they're needing childcare, we have co-located staff at our Family Solutions Center where we're able to provide them those linkages to childcare staff. If they're needing assistance or having questions on their gain, um, with their gain case, we do have every Family Solutions Center has a co-located um, homeless um, caseworker from DPSS, so we're able to go ahead and link them there and they are able to provide them those information. Um, in addition to um, all providing them linkages, we also do the housing search with them. We go ahead and we do a budget plan. We see what the family's income is. Now keep in mind that families do not need to have income um, when they are walking in through our doors because we follow a housing first model um, in which we believe that every, every family is ready to be housed once entered into our program. So the housing case manager will go ahead and explore the options that the family has based on the income that they have. Maybe um, mother has an ill child and is unable to work, okay, let's explore um, getting you and I um, becoming an in-home supportive service worker for your, so that you're able to get paid for the work that you're doing and that will allow you to increase your income. So we're definitely exploring ways to increase the family's income while also providing them that housing search, looking for available housing units um, and what would best fit the family's needs. And so in addition to that, we're able to facilitate the move-in process where our um, the cap, uh, case managers negotiate um, with landlords, the rental assistance, uh, making sure that we conduct a property inspection to ensure that um, houses are habitable for our families. There is appropriate outlets. The roof is appropriately covered. It, it, there doesn't appear to be any leakages. Um, the water is actually running. The toilets are actually flushing. So we go ahead and do take care of all of that in case management in the rapid rehousing component. Um, we, like I said, we do housing stabilization as well, and I'll talk a little bit more about that moving forward. Some of the supportive services that are provided through um, the rapid rehousing case management is we facilitate assessments with co-located staff at the day of intake. We believe that families are already being burdensome, um, having to uh, transport themselves to our Family Solutions Center. So we want to provide as minimal barriers to the family um, and easy access to services. So at the day of the intake, um, at the day of their assessment, they are to meet with our DMH mental health counselor that we have, our, um, our employment retention specialist that we have here on site, our substance um, use counselor, our LAUSD pupil free counselor, our DPSS and GAIN staff, and mental health services if it is requested for their children. So at their day of their intake appointment, um, families are scheduled at least um, a one and a half hour window to come into our office to complete an intake. We provide them linkages to all of our co-located staff so that the family has the option um, to either accept the, the resource that is being offered to them or decline it at that time. Should the family express, it, express a need in child care services later throughout their rapid rehousing enrollment, we are able to once again relink them to those services. Um, now, as I was mentioning, we have crisis housing with our Family Solutions Center. However, um, these are some of the resources that are offered. Um, we, our goal for rapid rehousing is to provide a safe and low barrier housing first and very short term emergency stay for families that are experiencing homelessness or at immediate risk of becoming homeless. Um, so we will, once again, when entering into the rapid rehousing, um, into crisis housing, we try and problem solve with families to see if there is any way that um, we can potentially explore the option of them staying with a family member or with a friend temporarily while they are still receiving um, rapid rehousing services. And sometimes that may not be an option for families. And at that time, we explore um, entering into crisis housing. Crisis housing availability is subject to the FSC's capacity and may vary from spot to spot depending on the funding availability that is available for FSC. We have, a, we have housing locators within our Family Solutions Center and their uh, centralized role is to uh, conduct outreach within the uh, service planning area seven. Um, and uh, anywhere else in Los Angeles County where families are able to, um, where there's any homes for, for rent. Um, so we're able to 
increase our housing availability and housing resources for families so that a person, their central role is to go out into the community and outreach to landlords, explain to them what our program is, the services that we offer. Um, now, when the housing locators are going out into the community to look for housing resources, they are not um, they are not advocating that we work with homeless families. We go ahead and we advocate that we are um, outreaching for working families who are currently um, looking to um, for housing services and kind of the program um, itself, what we offer as a whole child or any other family solution center as far as financial assistance. So the financial the financial assistance that is um, provided to families through the FSD um, is the move-in fees, which includes security deposit, first month's rent, and short-term rental assistance. We provide furniture assistance and rental arrears for families that are at immediate risk of becoming homeless and we need to cover a rearage for them. Um, now, please note that um, the financial services that are offered vary from FSC to FSC because it is subject to funding availability. Housing stabilization. So once we have a family who is housed and has already been housed for three months and they're stable in their unit um, that, they're, uh, that they entered through the rapid rehousing program, they would then enter the stabilization phase. So in stabilization, our goal is to ensure that families continue to, to sustain the permanent housing that we have been found. Stabilization is a six month follow-up aftercare that is provided after the last month of rental assistance. So for example, we house a family, we provide them with security deposit and first month's rent, and in addition to that, we provided them um, two months, two additional months of rental assistance to stabilize that family. That family is now stable, they're able to sustain their unit, we transfer them over to our stabilization department. And although we do not provide any financial resources to the family, we're still providing that light case management where we're doing um, budgeting with the family, linking them to resources. We found that most often when families are really invested and understand the services that are available to them within their community, when they are, when they are facing um, challenges, they're able to tap into the services that are local to them in their community and they become more familiar with it, so they're more successful to maintain that unit that we've placed them into. Um, now, Laura had mentioned that we do have permanent supportive housing, so we definitely have a matching process um, for families that are in our rapid rehousing program and some for our prevention um, families. And the way that our matching process works is the family is entered um, into through our Family Solutions Center. We do our DIF, the data that Beth had mentioned, and then um, that will give us a, a score for that family. If the family is um, over, it has a high acuity score, then we are more than likely, um, rapid rehousing would not be the appropriate program for that family because they are needing a high, higher level of care that our uh, rapid rehousing program cannot tailor to, as it is short term. So through the process, we will bring in a family, we will be enrolled in our rapid rehousing program, but through that process, we are working to try and see what resources are available for that family for permanent supportive housing. Um, and this is where um, providing, uh, kind of doing a point of contact in our HMIS system allows us the availability to reach out um, to the appropriate participants, case managers, to let them know that there is a housing resource um, available. Every FSD is, um, has a CES matcher, family matcher, that will go ahead and we retrieve all of our, our information on families who are eligible through um, the CES countywide matcher at LASA. They will go ahead and submit a monthly report to us. We're able to filter out through, and depending on the resources that are available for permanent supportive housing, the CES family matcher will complete a match for that family. So permanent um, supportive housing, um, our housing resources are entered through my org, um, utilizing the HMIS system, and then we um, place whatever family is eligible based on the criteria. Some of the criteria for um, matching families is a family with a disability, a former veteran, and sometimes also families who have been touched by the DCFS system. 
Um, so once the CES matcher is notified, like I said, we are able to match the family successfully to that housing resource. And we work simultaneously together with the family, the matcher, and the housing um, case manager to complete that. And then they're able to then um, have access to affordable housing. So partnerships, CES, local resources and connections. So knowing when it's um, appropriate to link to another system. As um, Silvet and Laura have touched on, we have the family system, youth, the youth system. We also have um, support for veterans and then also for domestic violence, as Silvet was mentioning. So let's say you have a family that you are referring over to us and they are family once they enter. If children are detained, mother no longer meets the criteria for a family. So we do a warm handoff to the adult system and mom is still able to be serviced through the adult system. If we have a family that is currently actively fleeing DV, um, our family solution centers, um, crisis housing facilities, often don't have the safety mechanisms in place to protect um, victim, um, survivors of domestic violence. So what we do is we will go ahead and, and reach out to local domestic violence shelters to see what resources are available because they also do have the safety mechanisms in place. So maybe we can work with the DV provider to provide shelter and the whole child or any other family solution center will still carry on the housing navigation for that family. Knowing when to refer someone to a CES resource. When problem solving is no longer effective, um, then we are able to explore, are they needing prevention service, crisis housing resources, or rapid rehousing? And then also becoming familiar with your CES needs that are within your agency so that you are able to know what agency um, is appropriate to match your family to. So um, on the LASAS website, if you go onto their document um, library and search CES Countywide Leadership Contact, um, you are able to get a list of all of the agencies that are the lead um, for all, all programs. Um, and so you're able to pull that through. You'll have their information and you'll be able to know what, who your point of contact will be for that agency. And moving forward, should you have any questions regarding the FSB or um, the coordinated entry system, please feel free to contact Laura Diego and um, here is her information. Um, wow, thank the you so much. Oh, I, I want to tell a, a little bit about the rapid rehousing program. Um, I want to make clear that through the rapid rehousing program, we're working with apartments that are in the community and that are maybe privately owned or maybe have property management companies, making it clear that the whole child does not own or manage any apartment. So it can take, um, just to speak in about a timeline of the program, it can take three months, it can take up to a year for a family to secure housing. At the end of the day, the family is the one that needs to get approved for an apartment out of the community. They have to submit the application with their information. We know that currently landlords are asking families to make at least twice the rent amount in order to get approved. Um, the fair market rate currently for a two bedroom in LA County is $17.90 which is really high, we consider a family that is making minimum wage. Um, so really our housing navigators and locators, we call them magicians because we are um, convincing landlords to accept our family. Um, at the end of the day, um, again, the rapid rehousing program is very short term. So we are doing everything possible to encourage family to increase their income so that after our assistance, they are able to continue to pay their rent um, on their own. Um, in order for the whole child, and this is specific to the whole child, in order for the whole child to provide payment for the deposit and first month's rent, we want to make sure that the landlord or owner of the property is willing to accept a third party check from us. Oh, that's all Family Solutions Center. So able to accept a third party check for us, and with that, um, sign a W-9. Um, the, the, coming from the landlord directly. We want to make sure that we're providing payment to the correct person and to the owner of the property and not somebody that says, I am the owner of the property. Um, um, with also, if we're providing uh, move-in assistance for a family, we want to make sure 
that the apartment is within the fair market rate that LA County has um, decided or HUD. Um, again, for example, for a two bedroom is 1790. So if a family says, I found an apartment, a two bedroom for 2000, well, that's um, not reasonable according to what LA County says. Oh, that's nice. Sorry. Um, according to what LA County says, so the program will not be able to assist the family with that, just um, as an example. Um, and that is it for the rapid rehousing program. We can take questions. Great. Thank you for giving those examples at the end. So, Laura, we are doing really great with time. We have about 20 minutes to answer any questions. Mm -hmm. And uh, please make sure to drop those in the chat box. Okay, so um, the first question that came through. Oh, you have to no. please put yourself if you're in the call. Thank you. Early. Yes, that Thank was you. Sorry about that, I'm not sure who that was. Okay, uh, so the first question is, if families don't have transportation, is there another option for a CES coordinator to get in contact with them? Oh, hello, did you guys hear? Hi, this is, yeah, this is, yeah, this is Laura. Um, I know one of the things that the uh, participant and family can do is they, they can work with their CES lead or whatever the Family Station Center office is and attempt to coordinate transportation either through 211 public transportation and or maybe a homeless engagement team that might make themselves available. But obviously, it's something that would have to be coordinated. Hi, you guys, please mute yourselves. There's a lot of interference coming through. So we can actually also, hear what Laura is. Yes, and also because we know that sometimes transportation is a barrier to our families, uh, we prefer to do screenings over the phone. That way families don't have to travel to us and they know exactly at that time if there's going to be a program available to them. If but at that time, um, if at that time um, we, we know that the family is, um, qualify for a program, then we can arrange um, something with the family at that time for transportation. Also, that also gives them an opportunity to identify and ensure that they're in the right system and mm -hmm. in, in the right uh, spa location. Great, thank you so much. Um, so your next question is, what is the turnaround time for FSC to contact a family once they receive a referral? Um, when for the whole child and all agencies, and all agencies we have 48 hours um, from the time of referral of receipt the referral to contact the family back. Sometimes, um, if it's a referral, we have we have to make three attempts to contact the family. After the three times, we will not continue to attempt to contact the family because there's a high volume of referrals. But however, we do contact the referring party back and we say. You know, um, we were we try to to contact the family this many times. Please feel free to give the family our phone number so that they can contact us at their earliest convenience. And we, again, we also take server self referrals and phone calls, so that wouldn't be a problem for us having the family call themselves. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so uh, your next question is related to the Section Eight vouchers. Uh, the question is, what about for families who already have a Section 8 voucher, but they can't find a place that accepts it? We have searched on the LASA website for availability, and most places have wait lists. Um, Section 8 has a program called HIP, the Homeless, and Homeless Incentive Program. Um, they are able to provide families with housing leads and properties that already accept Section 8 and that are pre-inspected. So that would really t um, make the process faster for them. Again, for that, you would have to go through HACOLA, through the Housing Authority, um, so that they can provide them with housing needs. Um, in terms of the rapid rehousing program, for those four families that have a Section 8 voucher, we can still assist them. Um, however, they must be homeless at point of entry. Great, thank you so much. 
Um, another question is, um, we have heard from some of our families that some of the motels are bed bug infested. What can be done about that issue? Okay, when it, at, at LASA, we do have a crisis housing coordinator that works with all of the contracted uh, motels. Um, but, um, you know, if if uh, issue ensues, then they address it. But uh, to the best of our knowledge, that, that those are issues that are very few and far in between, and it's not a uh, standard. They are, um, they, there is a quality control group that goes out and does the business. Um, but like you, uh, you know, but with big but, but with bed bugs, uh, they may not be there yesterday and then they're there today. So it's a constant maintenance thing that um, uh, contracted motels have to, you know, keep up. I know, those are tricky little buggers. Yes. Um, <laughs> another, question. <laughs> um, another question is, if one family solution center is closed due to funding, can we refer clients to another FSC center in SPA 6? Okay, so um, the directive for all of the uh, CES family providers is that um, although they may run out of, especially because we run on a on a, a budget year that starts on July 1. So being that today is like the 17th or the 19th, whatever. Um, yeah, a lot, in some of the line items, they may be out of funding at this point. Uh, the new fiscal year starts on July 1, but if the, fan, but if the agency has already, uh, is at capacity uh, for either crisis housing or rapid rehousing, um, the idea is that the families are still to be screened and assessed and that they they go through the prioritization process uh, and then they once a, um, a slot is available for them they will be serviced there is you know uh, and when it comes to crisis housing i will say this that crisis beds are very limited uh, some uh, spots have more limitations than others but there is the more you know, there is that how there are you? And do uh, there is that possibility that crisis beds may be exhausted for that night, and maybe we could try the next day. Uh, we have always uh, we have two one one as a backup in the event that a crisis bed is not available uh, through the contracts that our CESs have with uh, some of the local crisis beds. We do try to work with two one one to see if they may have. A uh, crisis bed available overnight, just to ensure that uh, no family is out on the street at night. But they too sometimes experience limitations. I I have to be transparent about some of the limitations in the system. Okay. Um, your next question. What is that? <laughs> um, is the referral form available on your website? The referral form is available in the document library, so you can look at it there. And if not, I, I'm, you, we can go ahead and send that out. Actually, we uh, this is Anna. We did share the form, also the list of all the uh, family solution centers uh, in the contacts. We can send that again, right, Laurel? We yes, I'm going to send, send it all to everybody again. again. Yes. Thank, Thank you. you. Are there more questions, Sarah? Uh, there's a couple more. I just want to remind people to mute yourselves, please. <laughs> We're um, just so we don't get any more noise interruptions. Um, okay, so there's one other question here. Um, is there support out there for families who are not necessarily homeless but are interested in low income housing? You know, unfortunately, no. Um, the there are um, different uh, apartment units that are that have low income housing available. Currently, most of them are experienced a three to a five year waiting list. Um, you know, rent burden is kind of a standard here in LA County. The rents have, are growing at uh, you know at five times the rate that income is growing. So there are very limited opportunities for low income housing, unfortunately. 
and the CESs only address the needs of people who are either homeless or at risk of homelessness. Um, I also want to mention that the referrals work group is aware that there is a need to really expand and explore rather um, resources for that can help meet the needs in terms of low income affordable housing and so we have been discussing that as a resource that is much needed as well and um, we will continue to explore and see what resources are available and share with with all of you. Thank you, Laura. No problem. Okay. Um, do you guys have time for one more question? Yes, absolutely. All right. Uh, what can advocate? I'm sorry. Excuse me. What advocacy can families do on a legislative level to make change? Great. That's a great question. Um, I think one of the things that uh, we all have to be, uh, everybody who, uh, who is concerned about the housing crisis, uh, we need to advocate for the prevention of unjust uh, evictions uh, because what we've seen is that landlords have just realized that they're sitting on a gold mine. So what they do is they vacate their existing units, uh, you know, put new paint and new flooring and then, uh, you know, re-rent them for, you know, at least 25 to 50% more than what they were originally getting. So I think we have to um, make sure that we advocate to our local and state politicians to um, limit that. Also, I think that we um, are capping the rent increases. I think we have to advocate for some legislation on that level too. And also be open and have the discussion about having and developing more affordable housing units. Although they are in the pipeline right now, um, you know, everybody is concerned about homelessness. But then when we start to have the conversation about creating crisis housing and shelters in your community, then all of a sudden there's a change of heart. And I think that we really all have to work hard and have those difficult conversations and express to people that these are families. These are, the, you know, everybody's concerned about crime and substance abuse, but the reality is that the portion of people who are experiencing those issues in addition to homelessness is a very small. And um, most of the communities that have implemented a shelter or low income housing have had very good success. So we encourage everybody to do their research and to be open to absorb, if every community were to absorb a little bit of the homeless population that's in their community, then I think we would have a huge impact collectively. Great, thank you so much. Um, everybody still on the line? If we didn't have a chance to get to your question, Laura's contact information is up, um, and it will be in the, the webinars that I'm sharing via email. Um, Anna, did you have anything to add? Yes, I actually just have a few closing, um, just uh, expressing gratitude to uh, all of our speakers this morning. Your, the information you provided is highly valuable, and we have learned so much this morning. Um, we are hoping that folks that uh, log in a little later will be able to go back and hear um, Roberto de la Torre's um, presentation about DPSS and CalWORKs housing services. Uh, Laura and the whole child, you have provided uh, key information to help us navigate through the coordinated entry system and linking our families to fam the Family Solution Centers. Thank you so much. We are very grateful and appreciate your time and the information you shared. Um, if there are in nothing else to add, I just want to end the webinar again by thanking you and thanking all of our uh, home visitors and providers that log in this morning. Uh, thank you, LABBN and Laurel, for a, a wonderful job helping us uh, uh, with uh, responding to those questions and also for all the technical support that you provided this morning. Um, I want to open it to, we have just a few minutes, Roberto, Laura, um, to Beth or Janine, is there anything else that you would like to add before we close? No, 
you know, thank you so many for the opportunity just to, um, you know, share the information. Mm -hmm. And uh, we look forward to working with your family. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, on behalf of the LA County Perinatal and Early Childhood Home Visitation Consortium and the Referrals Work Group, uh, I thank you for this uh, opportunity to uh, learn so much from you this morning. Thank you very much. And we will be Thank you. of the attachments with the link to the webinars, uh, recorded webinar. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.